<clears throat> Alrighty. So, here's the question that I want to start by thinking about. I tend to think of the human brain as a hierarchically organized computational system with systems closer to the periphery processing more precise sources of information and systems closer to the center processing more abstract sources of information. And if that's right, there's a question about the nature of the top level mental representations um, that we consciously experience and the role that they play in individual action guidance and collective action guidance. And that's where I'm going to be pushing today. So some days I'm inclined to think and to assume that the personally accessible representations that we experience are little more than metacognitive smoke, which rises to consciousness and recruits our attention. Individual differences in the capacity for visual spatial memory and visual spatial thinking put pressure on that for me. I don't know what it's like for people to report experiencing pictures or images or anything of the sort. I've never had any such experience. I experience narratives. I experience stories that I tell myself. And in some cases, I find myself pressing more diffuse representations into those narrative structures. But that can't be the whole story. There's another story that's emerging in parts of cognitive science suggesting that top-level representations, top-level structures, top-level expectations allow us to resolve perceptual ambiguities. This comes through clearest, perhaps, in recent research on expectation-driven learning. So, for example, you see an image like that, and it's clear that those are numbers. You shift them slightly, and it's clear that they're letters. The one in the middle gets resolved automatically in light of your perceptual expectations. And there's good reason to think that something like that process is happening all over the place in human cognition, or so I'll argue. One other bit of the story comes through and I think links these two things together. This is a way of thinking about top-level metacognition as a, a structure that's in place that distinguishes us, in some sense, from non-human primates. But it looks like there are two distinct kinds of systems. One system generates perceptual internal anchors that organize and coordinate our ongoing behavior. Another set of representations facilitates intertemporal and interpersonal forms of coordination. One way to think about that is the difference between training an undergraduate to take part in an experiment in a lab and training a non-human primate to take part in the same sort of experiment. The undergrad typically requires one account of what needs to be done and one demonstration, and that's typically sufficient. For a non-human primate, it takes months and months of training to get them to the point where they can do the same task. That's not to say that the non-human primates are unintelligent or that they have capacities that are uh, uh, less significant than ours in some respect. But it is to suggest that our capacity for passing representations back and forth to one another open up a rich set of coordinative structures that can guide interpersonal forms of human behavior. And what I want to do here is to think about the relationship between those two forms of metacognition. I'll start now with a little philosophical framework. And it's a picture that might, or a place to start that might seem odd for some members of the audience here. What I want to do is anchor my story to a picture that was developed by a philosopher named Wilfred Sellers in the mid 20th century. Sellers, like many contemporary uh, philosophers and cognitive scientists, recognized 
that our capacity for imposing expectations on our ongoing patterns of thought was crucial to our understanding of how the world is organized. So as you see here, he says, perceptual consciousness involves the constructing of sense image models of external objects. The most significant fact is that the construction is a unified process, guided by a combination of sensory input on the one hand and background beliefs, memories, and expectations on the other. Sellers was drawing on, that's unfortunate, um, Sellers was drawing on some things that he'd taken from the philosophical tradition in Kant specifically. But he was also building on insights that were coming out of the burgeoning cybernetics movement. And what Sellers started to recognize is that when you think about an individual entity as an individual entity, you see a way of grounding meaningful thought in causal relations, which can serve as anchors to spell out our discursive patterns of thought and our discursive patterns of interaction. As individuals, he argued, we rely on image models that are built up through our encounters with the world. As we move through the world, we encode pictures of our environment that are isomorphic with the parts of the world we have encountered. And we can interpret these pictures as meaningful to our ongoing activity. We do that all using, claim sellers, and I think he's roughly right, simple forms of reinforcement learning that allow us to predict what's going to happen next. But everything changes when you embed two robots in the same space and try to get them to coordinate. When I mention to somebody, for example, that my cat is named Nutmeg von Satan, the image that they recruit probably looks something more like this than it looks like what my cat actually looks like. When we place two robots with different image models in contact one, with one another, and we force them to work out the similarities and the differences in the pictures that they have of the world that they've encountered, things get complicated. Disagreements require triangulation of our image models to capitalize on shared understandings as well as salient differences. And this requires claim sellers, and I think he's right, placing our claims in the space of giving and asking for reasons. <clears throat> so one of the things that sellers claims is that knowing what the world's like is always a social process. Here you see in characterizing an episode or a state as that of knowing, we're not giving an empirical description of that episode of st or state. We are placing it in the logical space of reasons, of justifying and being able to justify what one says. I think that's always a political process, and that knowledge only emerges through invention and reinvention, through the restless, impatient, continuing, hopeful inquiry human beings pursue in the world, with the world, and with each other. My claim that I'm going to develop in the rest of the paper is that to link our capacities for picturing the world to our capacities to build shared understanding, we need to appeal to two kinds of metacognitive capacities and metacognitive structures that parallel the ones that I uh, discussed in the introduction. Fortunately, there's a nice story poised there to fill that gap. Here's the way that I put it in a short paper with Dan Dennett. Contextualized thought triggers the production of a linguistic representation that approximates the content of that thought, yielding a reflexive blurt. Such linguistic blurts are proto-speech acts, issuing subpersonally, not yet from or by the person. And they are, are either sent to exogenous broadcast cast systems, where they become the raw material for speech acts, or they are endogenously broadcast to language comprehension systems, which feed directly to mentalizing systems. Here, blurts are tested to see whether they should be uttered overtly. As mentalizing systems access the content of the blurt, 
and reflexively generate a belief that approximates the content of that blurt. Systems dedicated to the fixation of belief are then recruited, beliefs are updated, the blurt is accepted or rejected, and the process repeats. Proto-linguistic blurts thus dress subpersonal outputs in mentalistic clothes, facilitating system-level metacognition. <coughs> That's going to be a little obscure, and I'm going to do my best over the course of the talk to flesh that out and make it clear. From my perspective, part of what's missing from most com uh, computational theories of cognition is a neglect of compilers and decompilers and a fail failure to recognize that top-level metacognition is essentially a virtual machine running on top of a larger computational system. Processes of decompiling convert person-level ex executable files into high-level language, which is easier to manipulate and to use. Metacognition analyzes the flow of that program and tries to represent it through a person-usable language. But since person-usable language occurs at a high level of abstraction, some parts of the underlying neural code might be impossible to represent accurately. The goal is to make that clear with a bunch of examples. I know that's a lot. And I'll let it sit there for a second while I take a swig of coffee. <clears throat> to make that clear, I want to run through one easy case and one hard case, which help to clarify the role of these two kinds of metacognitive systems. We're going to start focusing just on individuals, and then we'll expand to thinking about collective forms of behavior. In the individual case, I want to start with probably the most highly confirmed result across the cognitive sciences. This is the result that species from humans to non-human primates to rats to pigeons all have the capacity to represent the relations between numerical magnitudes in ways that map the world imperfectly in terms of observed statistical regularities. What they tend to represent is ratios between numbers, so that differences between smaller numbers are easier to distinguish than differences between larger groups of numbers. It's easier to distinguish between those two representations than those two. And that tracks in a statistically stable way across monkeys and humans. Whoops, I think I skipped a slide there. So it's an important thing to note is this is not something that just shows up in the context of discriminating numerical magnitudes. And recent work on non-human primates has suggested that they can do a simple form of addition and a simple form of subtraction. So these are going to be representations of that. Here's a basic form of addition. You present that to a non-human primate, and it will discriminate accurately whether the result corresponds to the right additional principles. But it'll do so in accordance with analog representations, not with discrete magnitudes. So if it had turned out that there were six of them there, the non-human primate would have assumed that the numbers had been added correctly. And interestingly, if you put people under high cognitive load, they'll make the same mistake. Here's a case of subtraction. And what you should have felt there is that things didn't go right. And what you see both in non-human primates and in humans is that mistakes like these trigger a sense that there's been an error and trigger a sense that there's a failure to conform to the analog pattern. Once again, only in accordance with ratios, not in accordance with discrete magnitudes. But it's something that feels disfluent. The circuits that implement these sorts of capacities are evolutionarily quite old. 
So they show up in the same kinds of circuits in uh, uh, monkeys, in adults, in young children. Old world monkeys and great apes diverged approximately 25 million years ago, suggesting that these are deep, deep kinds of capacities. The activity of these systems reliably predicts success on discriminatory tasks, such as magnitude approximation, and basic addition and basic uh, uh, subtraction of the sort that we looked at earlier. But humans show an additional pattern of response to these sorts of tasks. Humans show activity in circuits in the prefrontal cortex bordering on the insula when they process information about symbolic number. That's interesting. At some point in the human past, probably 22,000 years ago, humans started using tally sticks like these to mark we don't know what, but to mark something. These sticks provide us with evidence of an emerging human capacity for using discrete, linearly structured representations, which can be used, perhaps, to interpret those diffuse inklings that are produced by those other, more simple, more basic kinds of computational processes. Where analog and discrete values converge, our responses to mathematical problems should feel right, should feel fluid, it should feel true. And this should yield feedback, which allows us to correct our patterns and correct our tendencies in ways that facilitate the improvement of performance. And that might be the reason why PFC parietal connectivity, which is linking those two circuits, predicts math IQ. In one of my favorite recent experiments carried out by Jessica Cantlin, she had people, adults and kids, lay in an fMRI tube and watch Sesame Street. There was no task that they were supposed to do, they were just supposed to watch. And the beautiful thing about Sesame Street is that number tasks show up intermittently throughout the course of the show. Sometimes they're discriminatory tasks where you're looking at whether two values are the same. Sometimes they're symbolic number tasks. So what she got was an ability to track the resonance between those two circuits in kids and adults. And what she found was that math IQ in kids was pre predicted in a, to a very significant extent by the activity of that cortical circuit linking the prefrontal uh, cortex to the parietal cortex. My hunch is that part of what's going on here is that kids are learning to employ discrete representations that approximate their analog magnitudes. And where that resonates, it generates feedback that stabilizes and generates a stable signal out of the capacity to discriminate analog magnitudes and discrete magnitudes. You might not buy that point yet. And what I want to do is push just a little bit deeper. Here's another favorite experiment carried out by Epley and Gilovich, where they asked undergraduates to tell them what temperature vodka freezes at. Have them think about it for a second. And what they found, there's the ac actual temperature, um, 20 degrees, negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit. The responses people offered were between 7 degrees Fahrenheit and 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So they did a second phase of the task where they asked the undergraduates what they were doing. What they found is that almost all of them probably did what most of you did as well anchored on water, realized that you can put vodka in the freezer and that it doesn't freeze, and started to revise downward away from that. And in general, across a huge number of tasks where there's an easily accessible and easily available self-generated anchor, what happens is people take that anchor and revise away from it. When we fail to revise our initial hunches sufficiently, 
we fall into judgmental biases. And we often adjust insufficiently because we stop as soon as a plausible seeming value is reached, unless we are able and willing to search for a more accurate answer. And the reason here is because of the way that ongoing processing is working. First, we start from an anchor, and we start to move away from it. There's a sense that we know what the right answer is, that we know what a plausible response would look like. That triggers memory search. And the results of that memory search are tested against our sense of what seems reasonable. Positive metacognitive feelings trigger a behavioral response. Oh, it's seven degrees Fahrenheit. Negative metacognitive feelings trigger further search. And where you feel like you haven't hit a plausible value yet, you keep searching. You can shift people's response and make them more accurate by getting them to recognize that they don't know what the answer is. And the reason that happens is because that metacognitive feeling that this feels comfortable isn't taken as authoritative evidence. Instead, it's adjusted against the instructions which are coming at a higher level. So here's the thought. In that case, a conceptualized thought triggers the production of a linguistic representation that approximates the content of that thought, yielding a reflexive blurt. These proto-linguistic blurts dress subpersonal outputs in mechanistic clothes, and that facilitates system-level metacognition, and it guides the unfolding of person-level behavior. That's the easy case. Things get more interesting, and I think even more plausible, when we start to think about social phenomena and start to think about social behavior. So here, I want to move to a case that is very salient and significant in current uh, American politics, at least. <laughs> Walking through an industrial neighborhood, a person might find themselves becoming more alert and aware of their immediate surroundings as they start to feel a sense that things are dangerous. In general, that'll tend to evoke expectations about the likelihood of encountering threats, along with, in some cases, triggering stored associations between things like race or social status and violence. This triggers plan the construction of plans, that might be needed to escape potential situations. It also accelerates the heart rate and breathing. It triggers motor routines to prepare for free, uh, fleeing or fighting, as well as beliefs about violent crimes, which start to become more accessible and start to shape action tendencies and initiate cognitive search routines. In that kind of case, where you're in that kind of state, even a small amount of gun consistent information embodied in an object that's not a gun at all can resonate, resonate with action guided motivations yielding effectively valence perceptions that make it more likely that a person will react fearfully and will perceive something as a gun when it's not a gun. In this case, metacognitive representations and metacognitive processing are playing a critical role in planning at the top level. But metacognitive monitoring is also playing a, ro a role in resolving ambiguities in the encountered visual situation. To see why, we need to dive a little bit further into the architecture. Here, my interest is not with the circuits in the uh, uh, IPL that we were talking about earlier, but with evolutionary old circuits in the midbrain. The midbrain is a highly preserved structure which constantly computes value representations to be used and deployed in the service of action guidance. It contains multiple systems that are doing things like evaluating risk, 
evaluating uncertainty, assigning reward values, and the like. At its core, at its base, the brain is not just a predictive machine, it's a valuing machine. And it's easy to see why. We're mobile robots who run on batteries. And we have to dedicate resources, computational and behavioral resources, to find out how and where to recharge those batteries. The problem is, every decision we make is risky. Every outcome is uncertain. So we're constantly updating our values dynamically against the structure of the rewards, the punishments, the risks, and the costs that we encounter. And through that process, we build rich evaluative maps of the environments that we pass through. Just as importantly, much of our online processing relies on systems that facilitate interceptive monitoring, that is tracking our own bodily states and generating a sense of how we feel here and now. Systems that compute embodied expectations along with those systems that are monitoring sources of risk and reward salience, shape our ongoing patterns of thought and behavior as they push their values and push their contents upward through more levels, uh, through more levels of processing to higher level structures that are relying on abstract contents rather than those low level senses and feelings of uh, risk of reward, of feeling tense. This is part of the reason why things like physical uh, tension and stress and exhaust exhaustion, as well as our current mood, can shape the particular features of the world that we pay attention to and shape the features of the world that we remember. But we use top-level analytic metacognition that takes place in language or images or whatever else to label and categorize these states. <coughs> and what that does is it allows us to stabilize dynamic flows of information as we move through the world and to anchor those on to things that matter to us in light of our values and in light of our goals. As with the kinds of self-generated anchors that I discussed earlier, this process is iterated until we hit upon a value that seems plausible. Sometimes we rely just on our sense of risk, just on our sense of truth, or our sense of accuracy. Other times we hunt for more information. But if we're under stress, if we're under cognitive load, if we're uh, feeling exhausted, we're hungry, what we'll find is that the salience of those embodied states ends up dominating our ongoing behavior. And we only push those values upward in cases where we have time and motivation to think through things more clearly. So we often stop short of accurate representations of the world we live in. And as a result, we often replicate patterns of categorization that commonly arise in our culture, even if they're false. As I suggested earlier, moving through the world, we construct image models, our pictures, but only of the micro worlds that we live and act within. In general, our locally useful pictures are good enough to get us through the things that we need to do because we update them in ways that allow us to attune to the statistically stable patterns that we regularly encounter. Put more metaphorically, what we're doing is constantly taking part in a process of constructing locally useful image models of our mimetically structured umdum. What's going on is we're building up a set of representations 
that allow us to access the features of the world that are salient to us and that help us to see which features of the world afford success in our ongoing practices. But now let's think about the role that that plays in that top level pattern of coordination and in flows of information between individuals. Since we aim for representations that are good enough, our image models often diverge. I might think of spending time with my cat in a way that looks like that on that side of the screen. Somebody else might think of spending time with my cat like that. And using linguistic representations, we might begin to shape the way that other people construct their image models. We might be able to find ways to move them into the construction of a top-level representation that's more in line with our own. And that happens at multiple different levels. As we interact with one another, we bring our behavior, our speech, and our thought into alignment with the people that we surround ourselves with. And this is where interpersonal, where metacognition goes interpersonal. It's what drives us to bring thought patterns into alignment. Forms of social alignment help us to understand one another and to build macrocognitive or interpersonal structures that make thought and behavior feel more fluent, more stable, and easier. As individuals, we do our best to construct plausible image models of the world that we encounter. But in groups, thought self-organizes around local sources of information. We select information that's going to be useful for coordinated projects. We broadcast that, and that helps us to coordinate multiple representational systems operating at multiple levels in ways that allow us to execute shared tasks. Over time, this will stabilize in forms of we representation, forms of collective self-understanding, which are organized around the habitually encountered forms of speaking, of representing and expressing our understanding of the world. As Rick Dale and his colleagues suggest, alignment at multiple levels of cognition is necessary for this project to work out. But it's effortless and it's automatic. And we find ourselves constantly drifting towards the people that we habitually surround ourselves with. In part, this is driven by those top-level explicit representations. When we engage in acts of suprapersonal metacognition, what we do is we decompile our local evaluative maps and image models into linguistic contents, which can be broadcast and used to coordinate shared actions. Top-level metacognitive systems can then analyze our current image model and attempt to represent it in a person-usable language. But person-usable languages occur at a high level of abstraction. And some parts of our underlying image models are impossible for us to represent accurately. And often, they're just left out. Where that process works out well, information is broadcast as a coded representation that allows the receiver to be drawn into a state of cognitive and behavioral alignment with us. For this to work, shared representations have to be compiled into image models, that is, executable files that can be used for online action guidance. This, I think, is the upshot of the distinction that I offered earlier between humans and non-human uh, primates. With another human who has access to the same kinds of linguistic representations 
that I have access to. Those patterns of broadcast rapidly facilitate the compiling of an action value. For a non-language user, or for a different language user, or for someone who's socialized into a different linguistic community, that becomes far more difficult, and it requires processes of shifting in interpretation, of converting a representation into a different structure, passing it on to a receiver, often in a way that runs through multiple causal intermediaries. And we're seeing a beautiful example of this here, because the things that I'm saying have to be converted into a linguistic structure that's usable by someone who is not uh, uh, receiving the linguistic content that I'm broadcasting, but a linguistic content that's been broadcast through an intermediary. All of that, though, works in the best cases fluidly and automatically, and it feels comfortable. In part, that's because generally, what we do is construct epistemic echo chambers, which are populated by people who affirm our claims, who reinforce our strategies for decompiling image models into publicly expressible thoughts, and that calcifies through that repeated habitual engagement into strategies for thinking and planning in ways that limit the range of possibilities that we have to think through and that we have to entertain. It yields epistemic echo chambers that help us bring our behavior into alignment with the groups that we belong to, while at the same time making minds that approach the world in different ways seem bizarre, committed to misguided assumptions, or committed to weird and problematic sorts of attitudes. In such spaces, habitual thinking patterns and habitual speaking patterns start to feel fluent because the exchange of ideas with our friends, with our colleagues, with people who share our assumptions, feel comfortable. Those patterns unfold, unfold rapidly and they start to feel like second nature. We find ourselves socially in the flow. And this allows us easily to build and share linguistically encoded representations of our image models and to do so in a way that's relatively accurate and relatively shared between two people. That can get ugly, and it often does get ugly. It can push us into troubling sorts of practices. For example, in the context of everyday structural racism, code words, for example, ghetto, thug, urban, inner city, welfare, food stamps, and illegal immigrants. If anybody's seen our current presidential candidate speaking, you've seen thousands of these getting spit out. And those ride on top of attempts to minimize cognitive dissonance for people who have racist, low-level inclinations. In the US, kids are taught not to think about race and to see themselves as colorblind. So when they feel racist attitudes, it feels uncomfortable. So you have to generate a top-level representation that encodes enough of that structure to be broadcast to people that you agree with well enough in ways that they can unpack into a representation that has the racialized content built into it. Reflexive inklings about what to say often conflict with the outputs of our evaluative learning systems. But we can take up code words to feel comfortable with our patterns of speech and to make our patterns of thinking and speaking feel more fluent, more socially stable, and more like shared representations. As we broadcast them publicly, we know, perhaps only implicitly, that they will tend to be compiled in ways that parallel our own image models. At its pinnacle, these things can start to become solidified and stabilized 
as dog whistles. They become habitual and automatic representations as we entune to patterns of interpretation. Put bluntly, code words provide the conceptual structure against which we calibrate our picture of the world. And they come to shape the options that we perceive as, perceive as available, as well as the options that we perceive as off the table. With dog whistles, they come to delimit the boundaries around your community, the community of shared thinkers and th shared speakers. And dog whistles function in the way that they do because only your community or only someone who's tuned into your community will be able to parse them. But much of human thought and much of human speech functions in exactly that way. We don't recognize it, but our ways of talking and speaking and thinking are grounded in the practices of thought that are built into our communities. And because of that, we find it much more difficult to think outside of those communities. In a striking way, that can yield a pattern of neurotypical mind blindness, where neurodivergence of various sorts can only be understood as a limitation or a superpower. Neurotypical people have difficulty predicting, explaining, and understanding minds that function in different ways. Whether that's a matter of uh, autism or mental illness, or something else altogether. And part of what's happening there is the sense of cognitive disfluency that shows up in attempts to engage with a speaker who comes from a different perspective, who relies on different image models, who relies on a different understanding of the world, feels hard for us to feel comfortable with. And because of that, we move away from it. We don't think about it or we tell stories that are not anchored to the real phenomena. But just as importantly, capitalizing on those sorts of differences can provide us ways of shifting our attention to the world. And we can use that information as a way of de-aligning from our groups in a way that will allow us to work together to realign in better ways within our groups. Immigrants and racial and linguistic minorities are often compelled to live in spaces where their actions are perceived as disfluent. This can and often does yield the development of cognitive strategies for coping with things like marginalization, and it can lead to the development of local microcultures that sustain critical sources of contestation. When disfluency leads to a breakdown of coordination. Sources of stability must be sought, and that opens up the possibility for seeing the world in a different way. Fortunately, those top-level capacities for talking and for understanding one another can be used in the service of shifting and shaping our understandings of the world, provided we're willing to listen to alternative perspectives. Language games and social practices have the function of guiding interpersonal behavior broadly. They control the robotic structures that we are as individuals by bringing us into alignment and setting up a shared space for thinking. And they do that because of how they're integrated with our learning-based attunement systems. In social situations, Interpersonal systems select metacognitive information for broadcasts in the service of controlling the sensory motor systems of two or more agents involved in a shared task. That is, they come to form a, 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 a practice of suprapersonal cognitive control, where we rely on those top-level shared structures that are broadcast between one another using linguistic cues to guide the unfolding of our individual behavior. To move beyond our epistemic echo chambers, we can draw on resources from liberation theology, 
from disability studies, from indigenous practices of walking together in struggle. And what all of these practices suggest is that evaluative learning should always start with listening, with getting clear about why others value the things that they do, coming to a shared understanding of why others have the concerns that matter to them. And if you can get yourself worked up into a place like that, where you can actually listen to others, you can start to teach one another new ways of thinking and acting that open up new values and new commitments. We can think creatively, then collaboratively, as groups about how to build a world that we want to inhabit, rather than replicating the structures that are present in the world that we do inhabit. We do that by overcoming individual limitations and updating our evaluative representations by teaching one another, using linguistic representations to build shared and interpersonally structured plans and to act on them together. Those shared plans can constrain our behavior and open up strategies for collective action. And they can shift the worlds that we attune to so that our patterns of speaking, thinking, reacting, and responding come to be grounded in our local microculture that's moving against the grain of the cultures that we're otherwise embedded in. We can use mutual recognition and common knowledge of one another's needs to decide to give up on failing systems, to work together to decide what's a suitable outcome, and to prevent one another from accepting false ideologies, or so I think. But that's a story for another day.